Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, fascinating video today. We're going to react to the shocking reason why Jews refused Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, as their prophet by the channel Awaited Hour. Guys, whilst recording this video, there is a huge construction site just outside of my building. So if you experience any background noise, unfortunately, it is due to that construction site. Nothing we can do. The show must go on. Guys, if you appreciate my work here, leave it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. With no further ado, let's have a look. It is well known amongst Muslims that the Jews and Christians at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, knew about the truth of his prophethood and still concealed it. Many have spoken about the different prophecies mentioned in the Injil and the Torah. About the but Jews. Of people have mentioned I know, the, the Christians, of not the Jews sure. and Christians at that time towards the Prophet, peace be upon him. An attitude which further proved their insincerity on one hand and the sincerity and truthfulness of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the other hand. In this video, we will discuss a collection of authentic narrations telling the story of the Jews and the Christians of 7th century Arabia in the context of the appearance the dizzy, of the new Arabian Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salama ibn Salama al-Ansari narrates, While I was young, there used to be a Jewish neighbor living next door to us. Once he came to the place where our tribesmen used to sit and began to talk to us about resurrection, the judgment day, reckoning, hell, and paradise. I was the youngest of them at the time. He was talking to idolaters who never believed that there would be resurrection. So they asked, damn, is that possible that people will be resurrected again and they will either go to hell or paradise and they will be rewarded according to their deeds? I swear by the one who is sworn by, this will happen, he said. How can we be sure of that you are talking about, they said. A prophet will be sent soon. His locust will be here, he said, pointing by his finger between Mecca and Yemen. When can we see him, they asked. Looking at me, he said, if this boy becomes a young man, he will see him. Salama said, not many years have passed until the prophet was sent and this Jew was still alive among us. We believed in him, but he didn't out of envy and rancor. We asked him, woe to you. Aren't you the one who told us about him? He said, yes, I did, but he is not a prophet. Interesting. The Jews used to pray for victory in the name of Muhammad. In fact, the Jews, though many of them believed in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, refused to believe because they wanted this prophet to be from them. The Holy Quran commented on such approach of the Jews in the following verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, and when there came to them, the Jews, a book from Allah confirming what is with them, the Torah and the Injil, although aforetime they had invoked Allah for coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to gain victory over those who disbelieved, then when there came to them that which they had recognized, they disbelieved in it. So let the curse of Allah be on the disbelievers. Ultimately, the main issue with Judaism seems to be the ethnocentrism. Judaism is so ethnocentric. They think of themselves as the chosen people. They think of God as the God of Israel. And therefore, they couldn't accept a prophet that comes from another tribe than theirs. An Arab and not a Jew. They believe that prophecy is exclusive to them. But having this ethnocentric approach, you're concealing more monotheism ultimately you're withholding monotheism from the gentiles says in his tafsir before this messenger came to them they used to ask allah to aid them by his arrival against their polytheistic enemies in war they used to say to the polytheists a prophet shall be sent just before the end of this world and we along with him shall exterminate you just as the nations of ad and iram were exterminated 
Also, Muhammad bin Ishaq narrated that Ibn Abbas said the Jews used to invoke Allah for the coming of Muhammad in order to gain victory over the Aus and Khazraj before the Prophet was sent. When Allah sent him to the Arabs, they rejected him and denied what they used to say about him. Hence, Mu'adh bin Jabal and Bishr bin Al-Bara bin Ma'rur from Bani Salama said to them, O oh Jews, fear Allah and embrace Islam. You used to invoke Allah for the coming of Muhammad when we were still disbelievers. And you used to tell us that he would come and describe him to us. Salam bin Mushkim from Bani Al-Nadir replied, He did not bring anything that we recognize. He is not the Prophet we told you about. And Allah then revealed this wow. ayah about their statement. Ibn Kathir also narrates that Abu Al-Aliya said, the Jews used to ask Allah to send Muhammad so that they would gain victory over the Arab disbelievers. They used to say, O oh Allah, send the Prophet that we read about in the Torah so that we can torment and kill the disbelievers alongside him. Mm -hmm. When Allah sent Muhammad and they saw that he was not one of them, they rejected him and envied the Arabs even though they knew that he was the messenger of Allah. Wow. And the Holy Quran commenting on the situation says, those whom we have brought the scripture recognize him as a recognizer. Yeah, yet again, even though there are all the signs needed, they still interpret that it has to be somebody of them because this is what they prayed for and therefore they believe that a Jewish prophet will fight the Arabic disbelievers. However, a prophet has been sent to the Arabs and they became believers. Now, instead of accepting Islam, they are denying. Own children, but indeed a group of them do conceal the truth while they know. Exactly right. And this is quite fascinating oh. as well because I heard many modern day Jews speak about this. They actually admitted that Prophet Muhammad is indeed a prophet. May peace be upon him. So how do you reconcile this? How can you say, yes, it's actually true, he's a prophet, he has been sent to the Gentiles and still stick to your ethnocentric movement? Prior to the advent of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the Jews emigrated to Medina and Tema because they understood the prophecies in their holy book especially those which refer to the locus of the message and also the place of his determination. Ibn Ishaq says that he was told by some of Medina's dwellers, known as the Ansar, that the reason behind their converting to Islam was that they used to hear the following from the Jews. We were idolaters and they had a holy book. They had knowledge that we did not have. There used to be skirmishes between us. If we defeated them, they would threaten us by saying, the advent of a new prophet is approximating and we will kill you the same way the nation of Ad and Aram was killed. These threats were repeated several times in different occasions. When this prophet was sent, we believed in him when he called us to God, but they disbelieved. Yeah, yet again, they didn't believe that the Prophet will come from the Arabic midst, but from their Short own. Short before the Islamic call dawned on the Arab Peninsula. And then they reject him. Rabbi. It's quite interesting, actually, that they do not recognize the message, the message of monotheism that has come to that man that transformed the Arabic Peninsula. They do not recognize it. They deny it just because he is not Jewish. I, by the name of Ibn Tells you everything you need to know. came from Sham to the city of Medina, the city to which the Prophet was destined to emigrate to. Right. He read in the holy book that the city of Medina will be the place to which the Prophet would emigrate, so he came to dwell in Medina to be amongst those who would follow and support. Ibn Ishaq narrates that Asim bin Amr bin Qadada told him that a leader from Bani Quraiza, a Jewish chief tribe at that time, said, a rabbi from Sham came to live among us. His name was Ibn al-Hayban. I have never seen a man who perfect his prayer like him. He came to us two years before the advent of the Prophet. When there was a drought, we used to go to ask him to pray for rain. He would say, I swear I will do unless you give some alms before you go. We would ask, how much? He would say, a measure of dry dates or barley. So we did what he asked. He would take us to the back of the mountain and there we ask for rain under his leadership. No sooner he left his place, than rain fell down superfluously. He did this twice or thrice. When he was dying, we gathered around him. He said, O oh Jews, 
Do you know what reason made me leave the land of welfare of Sham to the land of hunger and hardships of Medina? We said, you know best. I emigrated because I expected a prophet to appear and this is his time to appear. This town is the place where he will emigrate to. Believe in him, let nobody else precede you. And he died shortly after his words. When it was the night on which Bani Quraiza, a major Jewish tribe at that time, was defeated, three Jews left their fortress and called the others, O oh Jews, we assure you that he is the Prophet whom Ibn al-Khayban told you about. They said, What are your proofs? They said, We swear he is as was described. And they all embraced Islam. Wow. It was a common theme for the Jews to have immediate hostility towards the Prophet Sallallahu right upon recognizing him as the prophesied one. It's known that the Jews were a proud people, and they expected that the Prophet to be from amongst them. The fact that the Prophet came from the Arabs was something they could not accept. Ibn Ishaq narrates that Safiya, the mother of the believers, who used to be a Jew herself, said, I was the closest child to my father's and my uncle Abu Yasu's heart. Whenever they saw me with a child of theirs, they would pamper me so tenderly to the exclusion of anyone else. However, with the advent of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and sitting in Quba with Bani Amr bin Auf, my father Huyay bin Akhtab and my uncle Abu Yasr bin Akhtab went to see him and did not return until sunset when they came back walking lazily and fully dejected. I, as usually, hurried to meet them smiling, but they would not return to me for the grief that caught them. I heard my uncle Abu Yasser say to Ubay and Hoye, Is it really he? The former said, It is he, I swear by Allah. Did you really recognize him? They asked. He answered, Yes, and my heart is burning with enmity towards him. I would love to know where the sources come from. Qus ibn Sa'ida, the leader of his clan, was a Christian bishop and a poet. The passionate sermon he gave during the Awqaz fair to a crowd that included the Prophet to be Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he spoke of the awaited coming is remembered for its wisdom. He said, People, come, listen, learn and take a lesson. Whoever lives, dies, whoever dies, perishes, and whatever is bound to happen, happens. Rain falls, grass grows, and children are born to take over the place of their parents. Then they all depart. Occurrences are ceaseless. They all follow up on one another. Beware and lend an ear to my words. The skies are filled with news. The ground with lessons to be taken. The earth is a mattress stretched out and the skies a lofty ceiling. The stars will expire and the seas will come to a rest. Whoever comes does not stay and whoever leaves does not return. Who knows? Is it that they are so comfortable? where they are, that they remain there, or are they withheld and put to sleep? I swear that there is a religion more beloved to God than the one you now follow, and a prophet of God will come, and his coming is near. His shadow hovers over your heads. Blessings to him who believes in the prophet and basks in the light of guidance. Woe to him who rebels and opposes him. Woe to those who squander their lives in ignorance. Mankind! Beware of heedlessness. Everything is mortal. Immortality lies only with the Almighty who is one, without partners, without alike. He is the only one worthy to be worshipped. He begets not, nor is he begotten. People of Ayyad, where are your fathers and forefathers? Where are the people of Ad and Thamud who built exquisite mansions and abodes of stones? Where is the Nimrod and the Pharaoh? who indulged himself in worldly riches and said to his people, Am I not your greatest Lord? The earth ended up grinding them all in its mill. Even their bones have now rotten away, scattered. Their abodes stand deserted, now inhabited by dogs. Do not ever become heedless like them. Do not tread their path. Everything is mortal. Only the Almighty is not. Only one. There is many a passage to enter the river of death, but alas, no way out. All things great or small migrate. Whatever befalls all shall befall you too.
This is an absolutely tremendous speech about the core of existence, about what it means to be a human even, how it describes that everything will die and that only God is eternal, that there is only one God and that nothing is like him. This yet again is of course the core teaching of Islam. Absolutely beautiful that this man already got it. He understood it before the coming of the Prophet. When he made this beautiful speech, Qus ibn Sa'idah was indeed. not aware that the Prophet he was announcing was present and listening. Mm. Qus did not live long enough to witness the Prophet's call to Islam, but his entire tribe, called the tribe of Ayyad, believed in the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, once they were made aware of him. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is reported to have asked the delegation of Ayyad about Qus bin Sa'idah. To which they responded with, He has perished, Messenger of Allah. The Prophet is reported to have said, Never could I forget the speech given by Qus ibn Sa'idah at the Uqaz fair. When mounted on a camel, he said, Whoever lives dies, whoever dies perishes, and whatever is bound to happen, happens. Yes. The Blessed Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, then asked them whether there was anyone remaining among them who could repeat his speech. One of them stood up and recited the entire speech. It is also reported elsewhere that Abu Bakr was the one who recited the speech in full out of his own memory. About Qus ibn Sa'ida, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has said, May Allah have mercy on Qus ibn Sa'ida. He will be resurrected as a separate nation in the hereafter. Passages like this could of course affirm the allegations coming from prominent Islamophobes because they say that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, copied certain sayings of the Jews, certain teachings of the Christians and therefore here we can see that this speech of the man has been narrated, has been repeated by even Abu Bakr potentially and of course I understand then why certain Islamophobes take this as few for their fire to say, hey, Prophet Muhammad copied other people. Not saying it's true, but I understand the argument. Abdullah ibn Salam, the most learned rabbi among the Jews, came to see the Prophet when he arrived and asked him certain questions to ascertain his real prophethood. No sooner did he hear the Prophet's answers than he embraced Islam, but added that if his people knew of his Islamization, they would advance false arguments against him. The Prophet sent for some Jews and asked them about Abdullah ibn Salam. They testified to his scholarly aptitude and virtuous standing. Then it was revealed to them that he had embraced Islam, and on the spot they imparted categorically opposite testimonies and described him as the most evil of all evils. <laughs> of course. Just as in Christianity, he's called an anti -Christ. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 12 years old, he went with his uncle Abu Talib on a business journey to Syria. Yes. When they reached Basra, they met a monk called Bahira who showed great kindness and entertained them lavishly. He had never been in the habit of receiving or entertaining them before. He readily enough recognized the Prophet and said while taking his hand, This is the master of all humans. Allah will send him with a message which will be a mercy to all beings. Abu Talib asked, How do you know that? He replied, When you appear from the direction of Aqaba, all stones and trees prostrated themselves, which they never do except for a prophet. I can recognize him also by the seal of prophethood, which is below his shoulder, like an apple. We have got to learn this from our books. He also asked Abu Talib to send the boy back to Mecca and not take him to Syria for fear of the Jews. Abu Talib obeyed and sent him back to Mecca with some of his male servants. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. It cuts off here, and I'm gonna wrap it up because the noise from the construction site outside is getting crazy by now. Anyways, that being said, the quintessence of the video is, of course, the ethnocentrism of the Jewish ideology. And I really believe that this is the takeaway point here to understand that religion is transcendent of the nations, that religion is not about a race. This reminds us, of course, of the last sermon of prophet muhammad where he states all mankind is from adam and eve an arab has no superiority over a non-arab nor a non-arab has any superiority over an arab 
And this is what I truly believe Judaism fails to recognize when they speak about the God of Israel, about the chosen people and what not. Religious matters should of course transcend the flesh. We're talking about spirituality here. If we look at so many neo-nationalist movements nowadays, they are really skin worshippers. Those people are so obsessed with the color of their skin that they are willing to go back to paganism because they believe that those gods are are white European gods. Or look at the nation of Islam, which is an abomination, of course, and not the true Islam. Or at the black Hebrew Israelites. What you will see is that they are talking about a god that is black. What a materialistic position to take, of course, absolutely devoid of any spiritual teaching, not recognizing that we are a soul in a body and not our bodies. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. As I said, I have to cut it off here. I hope the background noise was not too disturbing. If you like this video, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.